All right, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Carissa Lemon with the Bowling Green Warren County Metropolitan Planning Organization. Uh, thank you all for joining us on this virtual public meeting. This is the first time that MPO has done a virtual public meeting and I think most of us in our community are still dabbling with um, effective, effective public meeting platforms. Um, so I appreciate you all joining us today um, for the public meeting on the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, which is an overview. We'll go over um, the long range transportation plan, the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, um, which is an outlook to the year 2045. Um, we have some folks here from the city, um, some transit staff, Kentucky Transportation Cabinet, and the City County Planning Commission. Um, so if you guys have any specific questions, we will do some questions and answers at the, um, at the end of the presentation. Um, but I will go ahead and share my screen and go through a brief presentation with you all. And I will go through some specific projects um, after the presentation. Um, have any specific questions at any point in time you can send those through the chat box or you can uh, save them for the end of the presentation so, share my screen here All right, like I said, this is the public virtual public meeting for the Metropolitan Transportation Plan uh, with an outlook year of 2045. And so what is the what is the MTP? The MTP is the Metropolitan Transportation Plan. Um, this is the long range plan for the community for Bowling Green and Warren County, which is the MPO area. Um, and it has a forecast year of um, 20 to 25 years into the future. Um, includes broad recommendations for transit and for bicycle and pedestrian improvements. And it has more specific project priorities uh, for our highway projects uh, throughout the city and county, mostly on state maintained roadways. Just a, a quick, I think I skipped this one slide, but just a quick overview of the MPO. So the Metropolitan Planning Organization is the transportation planning organization for um, our urbanized area, but also for Warren County. So all of Warren County is included in the MPO planning area and things that the MPO does not do. So we mostly focus on planning and advisory roles. So we don't do any sort of specific project design, um, right of way, utility or construction of individual projects. All of that is under the responsibility of uh, the individual jurisdiction, such as the city of Bowling Green, Warren County, or Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. Um, so this is just dealing with uh, future planning and advisory roles to our transportation system. All right, so MTP goals. Um, we established these goals at the beginning of the development of the plan. Um, and this ranges from mobility uh, to safety, efficiency and reliability of our transportation system, wanting to support economic vitality, um, continue to support our environmental stewardship and improve health and wellness of our community and its inhabitants, and uh, also seeking to um, continue coordinating and collaborating with our sister agencies, such as City of Bowling Green, uh, Warren County government um, and the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet along with um, multiple other agencies. So the, what is included in the plan? Um, transportation trends. Um, so the plan acknowledges that uh, there are uncertainties within our transportation system and some of those are related to emerging technologies such as autonomous vehicles, uh, delivery drones, um, recognizing just the need um, to accommodate for changing transportation demands. Um, and I think most of us would be able to see this with this pandemic, especially that um, maybe you guys are ordering more things online and you're having a lot more delivery vehicles going through your neighborhoods. Um, so I think even amidst this pandemic that we are experiencing an, uh, an influx of delivery vehicles. And I think that will, that is a lot of research points to that um, increasing in the future as well. So the plan does, acknowledge this uh, to the greatest extent possible, um, knowing that there is a lot of uncertainty amongst all of these topics. Um, but we recognize that 
these are things that we need to be considering um, when we plan for the future of our transportation system. So the plan also includes some socioeconomic characteristics. <clears throat> um, going through uh, just that Warren County is the fastest growing county and second fastest growing county in the state of Kentucky. Uh, we're second to Scott County, which is just north of Lexington. Um, Bowling Green Warren County serves a regional population of about 300, just over about 300,000 people. Um, and we are conveniently located between Nashville and Louisville, as most of you know. <clears throat> we can serve about 60% of the U.S. population within a day's travel. And so that situa situates us um, for the growth that we are experiencing in many ways. Um, like I said, um, we've experienced a lot of growth over the past 50 years. Um, we've experienced 129% growth rate. Um, and by the year 2045, we are expected to grow to a population of about 198,000. And the plan then details uh, existing transportation facilities. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so we have commuting patterns, about 81% of our residents drive alone um, to work for their commute. Um, we have a growing number of daily vehicle miles traveled in the past 10 years. Um, that number has grown by about 5%. And so how much are our, are our community members traveling? Um, what kind of travel patterns are happening on our roadways? And that is that has grown and will continue to grow into the future. Um, we have about 47 miles of various bicycle and pedestrian accommodations. This does not include our sidewalks, but this includes um, paved and unpaved pathways throughout our parks and our greenways, some bike lanes. Um, and as far as other alternative modes of transportation, we also have GoBG Transit and Topper Transit. Topper Transit serves the w WKU campus community and GoBG serves primarily the urbanized area, which is essentially city limits and with some location beyond the city limits as well. So this map looks at uh, locations of fatalities over the past five years. And so of these fatalities, um, the top two causes of death in Warren County are from alcohol impaired and speed related driving. Um, so those are the top two causes and the state of Kentucky has put out a strategic highway safety plan and within this safety plan, um, they have established some emphasis areas for um, local jurisdictions to really focus on to improve and to work towards uh, zero deaths across the state. Um, so we do have, looking at the map, it looks like there's a lot of fatalities um, and some of these are concentrated in common areas, um, as you can see some along I-65 through here. Um, and then this next map that we have, is looking at um, all crashes, so all types of collisions, whether it's just property damage, injuries, or fatalities. And so where are those hot spots in all of those crashes? And so we can see that some of those hot spots are landing along the bypass. We have the bypass um, in Broadway Avenue, the bypass in Fairview Avenue is some hot spots. Um, that intersection with Nashville Road and Campbell Lane and then moving along Campbell Lane uh, upwards towards Gary Farms Boulevard and the mall area. And then the section of um, Scottsville Road between Campbell Lane and just past the I-65 interchange. So those are all hotspot locations for crashes. And so this is helpful for us in determining um, future projects, knowing that safety is a primary goal of this plan. And we want to continue to create a safe transportation system for our community. Um, so recognizing that these are high crash locations, what kind of projects can we implement in some of these locations to improve safety for our roadway users? <clears throat> and this map is just identifying congestion points throughout the urbanized area. And so we can see Scottsville Road, as many of us may know that Scottsville Road, that section um, covering about from Wilkinson Trace through Cave Mill Road is pretty congested along with parts of Campbell Lane near the Nashville Road intersection. And then the bypass near the Fairview Avenue intersection is also, um, those are some of our more congested areas there in the red. And so you can just kind of see um, some of those more congested areas based on uh, vehicle hours of delay. So how many hours of delay is a vehicle waiting um, 
and that kind of helps us measure what types of congestion are there. And this is looking at public input. So last fall we did a public input survey. Um, we reached about 430 people um, who participated in the survey. And through that, we asked a series of questions and I just picked two of these for the purpose of this presentation. Um, we asked a question of what, type, what types of future modes would you want to use into the future? And so the top three there, as you can see, are walking, biking, and public transit. So those are some of the, the types of transportation that the public, the participants who participated in the survey um, wanted to be able to use into the future. And then we asked another question about what are some of your top priorities for the future of Bowling Green and Warren County? And of all of those, um, you can see that those are listed in order of importance there. Um, so promoting economic development is one of the top priorities that those participants um, voted on in this survey. And then encouraging a more walkable and bikeable community was also um, a top contender. So the MPO has a, what's called a travel demand model. And so this is created and maintained by the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet for our MPO. And this essentially just um, helps us as the MPO or as we do various transportation studies throughout the community. Um, it helps us determine the um, expected demand or the projected demand on our roadways. And it has everything from socioeconomic um, characteristics in it to including your population data, um, employment data, and it projects um, based on a 2018 base year, and it projects out to the year 2045. And so it also looks at roadway demand based on um, that population and employment uh, that is in the model. And so our traffic travel demand model is expected to increase, um, our roadways traffic volume is expected to increase by about 32% um, by the year 2045. And so that ends up to be about a 1% annual growth rate um, in vehicle miles traveled over the next 25 years. And so now we're going to move into some of our, those priority projects um, that have been discussed some. And so the MTP breaks up our priority projects into the short range projects and the long range projects. The short range projects covers, cover the years uh, 2020 to 2026. And so the short range projects include um, essentially all the projects that are in the 2020 Kentucky State Highway Plan um, in conjunction with the TIP projects, which the TIP is the Transportation Improvement Program, and this is created and monitored by the MPO as well, and it is kind of a subset of the M MTP as well. Um, so the short range projects um, are these 2020 Highway Plan projects and these TIP projects, and the total estimated cost in 2020 dollars for those projects would be about 140 141 million dollars um, to complete those and we'll go through some of those um, after this presentation as well. And so those long-range projects are ranging from the years 2027 to 2045. They're broken out into three uh, year intervals. So we have 2027 to 32, 2033 to 38, 2039 to 45. And those were these projects that are included in the long range uh, list. These were prioritized and ranked through our technical, the MPO's technical advisory committee. Um, and so they vetted through these projects and went through some of the project descriptions and we determined um, so what some of those priority projects are, what are some of the highest needs in our community with safety, um, with congestion, with knowing where growth is occurring in different parts of the county, um, but also taking into consideration some wanting to implement some lower cost, um, more quick win type projects. Um, and so we have a total of 28 projects in this, in the long range priority projects list. All right. So moving on to other areas that the plan focuses on. So we have our transit focus areas and the transit focus areas are just trying to look at um, improving access for more users within our community. Um, so right now, GoBG Transit primarily serves um, within the urbanized area. And so I think that there have been conversations to want to expand that out into the county and even have a, a regional approach to 
uh, transit connections for our surrounding counties as well to come into our community and then leave as well to get back home. So trying to improve those regional and um, countywide connections for transit. Um, wanting to increase service frequency and create more streamlined services for um, what is existing today, but also trying to improve efficiencies uh, for management and operations and just um, expanding those service areas and uh, just allowing um, more opportunities for folks to be able to use transit. And then we have some bicycle and pedestrian focus areas as well. And so primarily, um, this is looking at wanting to connect gaps in our existing greenways network and provide greater accessibility for more users um, throughout the community. And most of our greenways trails right now are concentrated within the city limits or, or that urbanized area, um, but wanting to expand those to connect to some of our county parks where there are also some walking trails at those parks as well. And so we wanna work towards this idea of a city loop. Um, some of you might've heard of this idea, but the NPO has a Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, or the BCAC, and so our staff has worked with this committee to essentially create this idea of a city loop that would connect some of our existing trails um, to each other, and then it would provide opportunities to connect to some parks and schools, which are all um, some of the goals for bicycle and pedestrian um, improvements in the community. So, in talking about that, City. All right, so in talking about that city loop idea, um, this is the idea that was proposed um, by the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, essentially going around the, the city, um, and it connects and uses many of our existing trails. Um, and some of those, there's one in the West End, if you follow my cursor here, this project is currently not constructed, but it is funded, so we went ahead and showed it on this map for the purpose of this plan. And so some other MTP focus areas that the, the plan um, kind of highlights are accessibility and connectivity. So wanting to improve accessibility and connectivity throughout our existing transportation system, both uh, between modes of transportation, so between driving, walking, transit, biking, whatever your mode could be, trying to provide greater accessibility and connectivity, but also within our existing roadway network. And then also looking at safety and security, so wanting a reliable transportation system uh, while also improving the safety of all users. And then we're looking at maintenance and operations. So what, how can we best um, maintain the existing system that we have today and continue to work towards operational efficiencies within our existing transportation network. And then we're looking at environmental mitigation. Um, so ensuring that all facets of the environment are considered with our transportation projects. So this looks at social, cultural, historical, and natural um, environmental factors. And just a note on the plan. Um, so this can be a little confusing um, just because projects are listed in the plan as our priority projects. It does not ensure that they will receive funding or when they may receive funding, um, but these are conceptual project priorities. Um, they're recommended through the NPO committees um, with public input considered in that as well as in data analysis. And so we consider all of these things and we create these priority project lists. And as um, we work towards the development of a new highway plan every two years, uh, these MTP priority lists are considered in that highway plan development, which is what um, the state uses to fund transportation projects. So the next steps of this plan, we're currently in a 30-day public review and comment period through August 28th. Um, and in that time, we will receive comments from the public and our MPO planning partners and we will be making revisions to the plan and including all the public comments as part of the plan as well. And then at the September 29th policy committee meeting, which is our decision-making body of the MPO, uh, the final MTP will get approved and it will be established as um, the guiding document for the future transportation system. And so we're welcoming any comments. If you guys don't have comments or any questions today, you can feel free to email me at the contact at the email contact listed on your screen, or you can mail those 
um, to our mailing address listed there as well. Um, also, we have some contact information. Um, just myself, Greg Meredith with the City of Bowling Green, Joe Plunk with KYTC, and Josh Moore with Warren County Public Works. So if you guys have any specific questions from any of those jurisdictions, feel free to contact them, um, or you can contact me and I can point you in the right direction of those as well. So at this time, we will take any questions that you all may have. Me at all. Hello. May I say something? Yes. Uh, my name's Richard Thomas. I live at 1177 Kentucky Street. And I got word that uh, the uh, paving project's going to happen on Kentucky Street that's uh, proposed to make Kentucky one lane in one direction with a bicycle lane, et cetera, et cetera. And I was going through the, uh, the, the uh, your plan and MTP 31 references a road diet for 2027 at $125,000. And I'm guessing that is the cost to reconfigure the traffic lights and make Adams a two-way street. Is that correct? The cost, <clears throat> excuse me, the cost listed for that project just covers um, overall paving and striping or any sort of signage that may be required for that project. So even though um, this would fall under a repaving project, um, it, it, that cost estimate is accounted for should we do this as a standalone project, not with a repavement. Uh, but they're they're basically deciding right now how to do it, and I don't think it's the correct way. I think the correct way would two lane on Adams from uh, from Veterans to uh, to the Dead Man's Curve and get rid of the Dead Man's Curve up at the, up at the beginning at Kentucky and. Uh, make Kentucky a local street and the, everyone would benefit. And apparently for another 127,000, you could do it right now and do it right. So that's what I'm advocating. And, and we, we just heard about this through the newspaper. Why weren't we consulted? all the property owners along that portion. I mean, we can do this thing right the first time and everyone's a winner. Mr. Thomas, this is Joe Plunk. I'm with Transportation Cabinet in Bowling Green. Hi. I read your comments earlier and I wanna tell you how much I appreciate your thoughtful response. Uh, Carissa received those and she sent those around to the project team, the city, uh, KYTC and others and oh, uh, thank I commend you, you for thank taking you. the time and providing a thoughtful response. You know, I was talking to an acquaintance of mine who he's a little bit older than me, but he remembers visiting his aunt who lived on Adam Street. And this would have been in the early 1970s. And he said that he remembers at the time Adam Street being Two way, so I don't know exactly when all that changed, but I'm guessing somewhere in the yeah, mid 70s. We're essentially on the first bypass, which included 31W, that circle that's there, where the first bypass. I thought that was pretty fascinating to hear him recall how that used to be. And I want you to know that the group, we, you know, actually our goal at the time when we started the study was to look at doing exactly what you say, which is to de-emphasize Kentucky Street, and move everybody over Adam Street. But here's the one catch. So I want you to imagine that you're a driver, a motorist, and you're coming from WKU and you're going toward downtown or veterans. Now you're on Kentucky Street. But as you propose, um, you would be on Adam Street going, you know, two-way traffic. 
Yes. The catch here is that there's not enough width in order to provide a turn lane. And during peak times, so imagine you're coming up to where the, the marathon or the T-Mart is, and you've got one person that yeah, wants to turn so you left. Can't, you can't fit three lanes in. That's the catch. It's a parking <laughs> lane. How, 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 what's the, uh, what's the, can't you narrow the other lanes to 11, say? That would really slow traffic down and rate it at 30. And uh, and you could even do your ITS on it later and get everyone slowed down and, you know. Yeah, and, and this is not a done deal by any means. These were just recommendations okay. from the study. So how wide, you... how wide is the pavement there? In some areas, it's less than 30 feet on Adams Street, and that's the okay. challenge. Is it's tip, you know, at a minimum, we want three 10 foot lanes, and that would be a challenge in order to provide any kind of left turn. So, all it takes is one left turner, and it you're going to hold traffic up. So, in that case, it's not a win, it's not a win for the the vehicular well, traffic. Well, no, it's they, they would be slowed down and basically. Uh, limited to people doing business on that street as opposed to the cut through racing that we have going on right now. But think of this as a, uh, a middle ground, a compromise, if you will. So I know you said your address is Kentucky Street. You were talking about the fast moving traffic. Well, now with only one lane, that will help meter traffic because uh, everyone's gonna be in a I, single lane. I don't know how the bike lane would be enforced and that would be a problem enforcing because there are no bikes basically. A lot of pedestrians, so yeah. Well it, it is a pedestrian street that's just fighting to stay alive as one with a major highway running fast through it. So you may not agree with the logic, but that's what led, led us to that final recommendation. But again, we appreciate comments like what you're providing, and maybe there are others on here or others who will comment in the next 30 days who will wow. feel the same way you, okay. you do. Yeah. I'm... Okay. Well, I've said my piece. Thank you for listening. Thank, Thank you. My name is Catherine Mallon and I'm an avid cyclist and I just had a couple questions about the bicycling plans in and around the city. Sure. The outer loop sounds great and as someone who not only cycles for fun but also cycles as my preferred method of transportation, I really am excited by that. Um, I was wondering if there'd been any discussion about the material used for the outer loop. One thing that um, some of the greenways are currently constructed with they're constructed with the, the squares that are like sidewalk squares versus continuous pavement like a road. Um, and while it doesn't seem like a big difference for a cyclist, the continual bump, 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 bump of the sidewalk squares, um, it does make a difference. So I was just curious if there had been any discussion about that or any, um, any decisions made on that end. And then, go ahead. I can say, and then my other um, question, is there been any discussion about adding more bike lanes? I know when we redid the, the square downtown, it was great to see the added bike lanes and also added bike racks, um, which was super exciting. Um, and then the third question, just to throw them all at you, and um, I don't know if this would be for this group or someone else, but when you get to a traffic light, I think some of them may be triggered by the weight of a car, and I could be totally wrong on this, but is there any suggestions on how we can actually get cyclists to trigger the green lights? Um, I'm thinking in particular, you know, sometimes they have walk signals and you can actually get off your bike and go over and press the pedestrian button and then come back into the middle of traffic. Um, but those are just three things that when I ride around town that I think of and I just wanted to hear your guys' thoughts on those. Thank you for those questions. Those are very valid questions. Um, I'll try to answer some of these and Anyone else feel free to chime in at any point in time as well. Uh, so the first one about the materials used. So the outer loop or city loop idea is just conceptual and proposed. So there are not any definitive plans to construct that at this point. Um, so the material used would be determined um, upon 
um, dedicated funding for any section of that sort of project. Um, and that would also be determined in the design phase of that project through the project team um, and the project engineers with that as well. Um, so that I know typically um, a lot of our greenways are constructed with concrete. Um, and I think you're referring more to having a preference of asphalt similar to what's on a section of Cemetery Road and Veterans Memorial Greenway. Is that correct? Okay. Um, and that's something that we can consider um, in future greenway projects as well. Um, more bike lanes. I know the city has uh, been talking about wanting to continue some of those downtown improvements and continue those bike lanes um, from downtown and eventually, eventually get to the riverfront. Um, so I know that those are ideas that we all want and things that we would like to see happen as well. And Joe kind of spoke to some of those potentials on Kentucky and Adams Street with that road diet project road diet recommendation. Um, and to your third question, cyclists to trigger green lights. I don't personally have an answer to that question. Um, Greg or Joe, I don't know if you have any great response to that. Um, yeah, sure. I can take a little bit of that. Um, the uh, traffic loops that, that uh, trigger signals are generally, uh, for the most part around here, they're magnetic. So the car or the truck or, or sometimes the motorcycle uh, triggers that. Often, though, we've got new technology that we're starting to put in place. Um, some use traffic cameras to, to uh, denote changes in the pixels. Others use radar, um, so they detect, uh, you know, a, a, a vehicle in a certain spot, and you can adjust those uh, for sensitivity. So generally, it's not a it's not a weight thing. It's a uh, around here, for the most part, it's a magnetic thing uh, in the traffic loop. It's, it's induced. Um, so as far as push buttons, of course, there's push buttons at intersections for pedestrians, for the most part. And we try to, you know, we try to put those in, in all places. And Joe can speak to this more, at least on city streets, intersections, anywhere we have pedestrian facilities, we want to make sure we accommodate for pedestrians. So if that, hope that answers that. Excuse me, I'm Francisco. I just had a quick question regarding uh, pedestrian, which were just mentioned. And I know with the um, widening of streets, a lot of times I know one of the, the ones that are being discussed in this is um, the 31W bypass. But my main concern is, is definitely uh, pedestrians for me, just because I come from a community where everyone walks everywhere. And a lot of the times growing up, I saw that a lot of the needs were not being met in terms of crosswalks and, and the safety of pedestrians. So my question to everyone here is, what have we done in order to ensure the safety of pedestrians when we consider widening streets and when we look at um, the expansion of Bowling Green and, and looking at our, at our transportation plan. Because again, uh, a lot of people still do not have vehicles, right? A lot of people move uh, and require and, and you know rely on their own two legs um, and, and bicycles. So what, what kind of things have we like looked at and, and done in order to ensure that we're not forgetting about those, those communities? Uh, I can jump in here, uh, and there'll, make, there'll surely be others too. So, Mr. Serrano, I'll, I'll say that um, what the project that we just talked about, the Kentucky and Adams Street, as well as the bypass, the road diet that we're looking at going from four lanes down to three, gives uh, more priority to pedestrians. So really what's driving that project on Kentucky Street is is the pedestrian traffic there at WKU, the pedestrian traffic in the residential area, the pedestrian traffic as you approach downtown. So I hope you see that that is an example of where other modes of transportation are carrying as much weight as motorized traffic. I would also say that wider streets is, is really uh, an enemy of the pedestrian. So you're not, you shouldn't be hopeful for wider streets, you should be hopeful for more narrower streets or fewer lanes of traffic. 
for the pedestrian. But those two, those two projects are the best examples. And I'll give you another, which would be Gordon Avenue back in 2016. Uh, that was two lanes of traffic in each direction. And what that means is people were able to pass and they're able to speed up. They routinely were going faster than 35 mile per hour speed. Now it's one lane in each direction with the center turn lane. That was my little and, cousin that passed away there. So I know exactly what street you're talking about. And that's the main reason why I brought that up. Mm -hmm. um, because when we're talking about pedestrians, uh, it's, it's a very personal thing to me. Uh, I, I obviously am not advocating for wider roads. I just noticed that in the plans that were being proposed, there are a lot of wider, you know, widening of roads. And that's why I referred to like 31W bypass. And you're right, you know, when we're talking about like Kentucky Street or Gordon Avenue, um, but it's, my main concern here is the safety of pedestrians and the safety of people in Bowling Green. Uh, what happened to my little cousin, what happened to Perp Grummet there um, should not have happened. And something should have been done a long time before something like that came to happen. And so, yeah, what's, what's there in Gordon Avenue right now is good especially for a school zone and especially for that community. I don't have anything more to add. I'm so, I'm so sorry about the loss to your family, but I, I'm just using those as examples of where, you know, lessons learned. We're trying to do better on pedestrian crossings and uh, you know, giving more of a priority to non-motorized transportation. Well, I appreciate y'all's work around that. Thank you. I have a question um, for Carissa. Um, I heard you mention about the bus stops, more bus stops going to be provided. And this is not exactly on streets, but I've noticed that particularly the bus stop on 12th Street um, has become a gathering place for the homeless where they can find shelter and a place to sit and assemble all their possessions and so on. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that. Um, I don't know that there's really, I, I don't deal directly with the transit system and with the transit agency. Um, and I don't know what there is to really, what roles that the city can play and what the transit agency can play in um, monitoring that. I don't know if anyone else can speak to that at all. Evidently this not. Jack, <laughs> I'm new manager here for transit and I have and I was going to be working with the city here in the near future to see what we can do ordering at the Stephen cut out a little bit here and there so I'll reiterate that. Um, Stephen is the new transit manager for the city of Bowling Green so he's working with the city um, but also he's working with the transit and so I think he had said this that location um, is something that he's going to look at and is going to work with the city on some of that as well. But I, I was thinking not just that one particular place, but it's very um, tempting that it looks like we've provided these gathering places, which of course is not the primary purpose for the bus stops. But I just wondered if this had been observed by anybody and whether there was <coughs> any kind of response, that, that's all. It's not a, a really big issue, thank you. Thank you for your comment. So we did have a question in the chat about roundabouts in Bowling Green. Um, and Joe uh, Plunk from KYTC responded, uh, Greg, do you mind uh, talk a little bit about uh, roundabouts maybe that the city has just installed and then maybe some of your future projects that you're looking at uh, and then before Greg starts I will just mention the county is currently installing a roundabout at uh, a small house road and Elrod Road uh, in the county so uh, Greg go ahead sure thanks that's a great question and and very timely in terms of of talking about pedestrian safety and moving traffic more efficiently and more safely. Um, so uh, on the city side, of course, the, the KYTC has done a couple of roundabouts and more to come, I'm sure, in the future. But on the city side, 
most recently, the, the neighborhood roundabout projects were completed, and those consisted of three roundabouts. One was kind of a rehab of the crossing, the existing roundabout at the crossings, to make it actually more of a modern roundabout to make it function without stop signs. That was, uh, that was done this summer, as well as a couple of other neighborhood roundabouts, one at North Sunrise uh, near Lambkin Park, and the other one right adjacent to it on Parkside there at Lambkin Park. So those were smaller roundabouts that eliminated, uh, in some cases, really awkward intersections. One was a four-legged intersection, and one was uh, three-legged that came in at odd angles. And so now there are no stop signs. Uh, traffic is, is flowing well and, and using those roundabouts um, as they should be. The city, uh, again, at Shav Lane, uh, the larger roundabout at Ken Bale was completed also this year as a part of a widening project uh, converting Shad Lane between Scottsville Road and Ken Bale into a three-lane section, lane in each direction, and a center turn lane. We have plans to continue on with Shad Lane from that roundabout to another roundabout at Middle Bridge Road, which will be the, the size and the uh, makeup of the roundabout is almost exactly as the one that was just completed uh, down at Chav Lane. Uh, and it will take traffic on beyond that point on Middle Bridge to a new connection uh, at Lover's Lane across from Searcy. So it's that open field uh, between Fruit Loom Boulevard and Middle Bridge Road. Uh, so with that, we've the city is looking toward the future. A uh, couple of, probably next fiscal year, depending on on budgets and, and, and how we rebound from the coronavirus downturn. Uh, we've got a couple of other neighborhood roundabouts that we're looking at in places that are conducive. Either the intersections, again, are not functioning very well with a stop or a yield condition. Uh, we've, got, we've got a couple of those that we have in mind. Uh, and I think the city is gonna continue um, to look toward roundabouts as an effective a safe way to move traffic efficiently and also to give pedestrians the ability to cross the road which is you know pedestrian safety again is so important thanks for bringing that that topic up uh, to be able to cross one lane at a time and to be able to have a safe refuge uh, in between crossing the other lane at busy intersections so um, the city is very interested in roundabouts and they've been successful we want to continue that Okay, I want to circle back around to a couple things uh, concerning uh, pedestrian crossings and sidewalks and more pedestrian uh, ways. Uh, we can we routinely, I think, and consistently uh, speak in the MPO about how to improve intersections, and uh, you know the city uh, sidewalk has a uh, I guess I, what I think for Kentucky anyway an aggressive sidewalk improvement program to uh, improve, uh, add, add existing sidewalks, but also improve uh, areas that may be uh, inadequate or maybe not quite up to, up to par. So, um, you know, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a good thing. And then also with even additional road widening projects, like one of the projects on there is the Nashville Road Widening. Uh, that uh, includes a greenway and and or pedestrian improvements with that as well. So we are uh, we are trying to uh, improve uh, the pedestrian system and network as well as the automobile network as well. So we do have those those things going on. The other thing is just the the bus shelters. Uh, <laughs> The bus shelter system, uh, uh, system and transit system. I think we'll work with Stephen and others about uh, design is one way you can discourage, I guess, uh, people from collecting there that may not necessarily uh, uh, supposed to be there. <clears throat> For example, not having a person link bench. You can put a divider in the bench to where it's you can't stretch out on it. You can only sit and wait. So. I think through uh, thoughtful design is one way you'll be able to um, provide the shelter needed for the bus stop, but also discourage maybe some of the unwanted activities. And then with that, I see Karen Foley has had her hand up for quite a while now. So Karen, if you have a question, go right ahead. 
I was just going to um, ask Carissa if her actual PowerPoint is uploaded on the website or if that's sort of the summary of what's included in the plan. Um, I did a couple of screenshots of a couple of her slides, but I, I didn't know if that was uploaded also and I just missed it. Um, so that was all I was going to ask. It's currently not uploaded to the website, but I will get that uploaded uh, shortly after the meeting. Um, and it is an overview, kind of a summary of the, the entire plan. Um, there are additional maps and, and data included in the plan that aren't necessarily in the PowerPoint. Any other questions or comments from anyone? I have a quick question. Go ahead. Uh, so part of the plan that you talked about um, is just talking about how we are a region. A lot of folks come to Warren County to work in the surrounding counties. And I know our uh, city funding for transit has to stay within the city limits. But a lot of the transportation issues that we see are because um, folks need to get to work outside of the city limits. So either to the trans park or other types of, or, or reverse, where they're coming from counties from outside of the city. So in this MPO plan, um, have we ever had a regional transit system here? And um, are we talking about that in any, at the state level or at a regional level? about how we can um, make public transit available with the patchwork of the way funding works right now where the city, uh, it can only be used within the city limits. Sure, I can speak to this a little bit and Stephen might be able to chime in as well. I know Community Action was working on several grants to try to bridge that gap between our surrounding counties and bringing them in and out of Warren County um, through some, more, some various rural transit grants. Um, I know it can be kind of complicated with the getting the grant funding for the urbanized area and moving in and out of the rural areas. Um, so I know that there were discussions and really recognizing the need of making those regional transit connections into and out of our community just for, for different um, commuting purposes and, and having those, those workers be able to have transportation. Um, and not just workers, but also folks coming into Bowling Green for um, uh, doctor's appointments and whatnot. Um, I don't know if Stephen can speak to that anymore, but that is what I know. Um, I haven't heard if, if any of those grants were received or not. I'm not sure if I break up here or not, but there are options and opportunities to expand transit outside the city limits, either by creating a transit district or having the other counties contract with the city to provide transit. There's so many different options. Um, I'd be willing to talk to people and discuss those options as I have experience with running some areas that um, had 12 different counties that had one big transit system providing rides to people. So there are options, um, but I'd be willing to discuss those with anybody who'd want to discuss those. That's great. I think since that's been identified by folks and workforce development as being a, a specific goal that has been brought up in this MPO. I think of, and just in my conversations with the community, folks from outside of Warren County asking about expanding our public transit system, um, but then also within Warren County, I would love to see us have that conversation and see if we can reach that goal um, as part of the, the goals that we've stated in this MPO. So that's great that we have options. Thank you. I think one, one uh, thing that we really need to consider too is encouraging transit oriented development to where we actually develop uh, um, housing and, and things, uh, jobs along tr existing transit systems rather than just building them further and further away from the existing fixed transit system. Um, I think that's, uh, that's part of the issue as well. It, it's not a one size fits all solution. Uh, obviously, uh, you get uh, a higher land costs the closer you get typically to transit systems, but uh, any of these developments that can be uh, developed on the existing transit system is, 
is really a, really a good solution to begin with. It may cost, it costs more up front, but it's a, a better solution for the community and for the residents of those facilities. All right, we've got a, we got a question in the chat box about um, the Elrod Road I-165 interchange. Um, Joe had said that the project is considered as a long range priority in our long range priority uh, projects. Um, and we will be revisiting that project in the next budget. Uh, so in the next 2022 Kentucky State Highway Plan. We can discuss that additionally if anyone has any additional questions on that. It may be worth just providing a little bit of context here for those that don't know the budget process. And I'll let the city answer for themselves, but for state roads, so think about roads with numbers like the interstates and US 231, US 31W, US 68. Those roads are state maintained and we work off of a two year budget. And so the legislature, it's proposed by the governor and enacted by the legislature, that's your House of Representatives and your senators. They have a budget year in uh, every even year. So 2020, what well, just ended in April, that's that legislative session passed a budget. And that's what we work on for two years. And unfortunately, not all the project needs that we have in the community made it into that budget cycle, including the Elrod Road interchange. But that's why I noted 2022 is our next crack at it. It's not that, well, we can just, you know, round that up and make it happen next month. We have to wait until the next budget cycle. But certainly your voice and, and you and your neighbor's voice will make those kind of, kind of projects more likely to happen in the next, next budget cycle. Do you have any other questions, general comments? All right, well, if that's it, um, we will go ahead and close out this meeting. And again, feel free to, uh, you can email myself um, or look for more information on our website. Again, I will get the PowerPoint posted as well, um, you can feel free to email me or you can call our office, uh, MPO is housed with the City County Planning Commission. And so that number is 270-842-1953. Um, so you can give us a call or you can email myself at carissa.lemon at bgky.org. And we'll take any additional comments um, for the next, through August 28th. All right. Thank you all for joining. Appreciate your input and your comments and hope you all have a good rest of your evening.